Luke Story, it is such a hands down privilege to have met you. I saw you speak at the Las Vegas Psychedelic Wellness Conference. And my husband and I were both there and we're both in recovery. And being introduced to psychedelics has changed our life. And it's just such an amazing path. And your story was amazing. To watch you speak on stage was incredible. So I'm completely honored to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, what you love and your work? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for your, your kind words and thanks for inviting me on your podcast. Yeah, that was a really that was a really special event for me. I'll tell you about who I am uh, in a second, but just to speak to that event, it was I think it was the beginning of something that I'll probably be leaning into much more and I was a little reluctant to lean into that particular topic before just because um, it's so potentially controversial and also sensitive. Um, you know, addiction recovery is, it's, it's serious business, right? I mean, people's lives are on the line and I know mine was and I've overcome countless addictions to substances and just about anything the human being can become addicted to um, when the intersection between plant medicines and psychedelics and addiction recovery and 12 step groups and all that. I mean, it's just, it's kind of the wild west. It's a, it's a really a frontier. Um, not that it hasn't been happening, but it hasn't really been mainstream um, and still isn't really the intersection. At least I think psychedelics are becoming more mainstream, but how they pertain to and can potentially assist in recovery is I think still largely unknown to most people in recovery, right? Like clinically, um, therapeutically, people in the fields of medic, you know, uh, mental health and psychiatric medicine and stuff are starting to build an awareness. But for those of us that are sober people, it's like, what? Um, so it was really fun to kind of put together that presentation and create some historical context that would align with my subjective experience as a person who was addicted then wasn't and has been able to very safely and and highly in a highly advantageous way use mind altering substances in a constructive productive uh, manner is is really interesting to me so I'm I'm glad that you enjoyed it and I loved hearing from people like you and your husband who were in the audience that were like hey we're here at the psychedelic conference and we're also addiction free I don't even know what you call it now you know Somewhat, I remember a couple of years ago, um, someone I was dating, I, I referred to myself in their presence as being sober. And she was like, I don't know if you can still use that word. You know, <laughs> I don't think you fit the classical definition of someone who's sober. You use a lot of substances. Um, you know, I mean, obviously intentionally and on purpose and at different times with different places that are, are, are very well thought out. But yeah, I thought you're probably right because I don't think many people that are sober are probably doing what I do, which is sitting in ceremony and, you know, uh, traveling to visit shamans and do all the things. So anyway, yeah, it was super cool. And thank you for being there. And thank you for uh, your courage and your husband's courage for exploring this kind of um, wild west that we're, that we're in now. Um, so yeah, super cool. And something I, I have a sense that I'm going to be really exploring more and, somewhat reluctantly becoming uh, somewhat of a voice and advocate for just because I can't, I can't withhold the benefits that I've experienced in my life because I know so many people in recovery are suffering like I used to suffer from just unhealed trauma and what I used to refer to me and my crew in recovery, we just called it untreated alcoholism we didn't know what else to call it. It's like you, you have trauma, you have torturous thoughts and feelings and erratic and destructive behavior. And then you quit doing the substances, but a lot of that stuff still persists, even though you're technically sober on paper and just that crazy mind that uh, recovering addicts and alcoholics often possess. We would just call it untreated alcoholism and how you would treat it is through spiritual work and service and all of those things, you know, now I have a much more broad understanding and it's just like, wow, it's just psychological wounding, spiritual wounding. Um, and even probably I would say even somewhat biological 
biochemical wounding that's taken place, right? That that can be um, to some degree healed through psychedelics. So anyway, that's that. Um, where I come from, I'll try to make it brief because one story gets really old after a while, you know. <laughs> but what I do in the world is um, I have a podcast called The Lifestylist. I do a lot of public speaking and um, sharing my healing journey on social media. And I'm in the process of writing my first book that sort of encapsulates all of that in a more broad way. And uh, yeah, I'm a child of the 70s, man. I grew up in Northern California and um, was in an environment that was rife with drugs and uh, was also culturally aligned with drugs. A lot of the hippies and quasi hippies from San Francisco, the Haight-Ashbury, et cetera, at the end of the 60s moved up north and everyone grew weed and kind of left San Francisco. And so a lot of the environments I was in were kind of ex-hippies and bikers. And there was just a lot of drugs and drug culture was normalized. Uh, which is fine. I have nothing against drugs, but I was also a kid that experienced a considerable degree of trauma, um, neglect, abandonment, sexual abuse, all the things. And so the genesis of who I became as a person was kind of the intersection of trauma and the readily available supply of drugs and the, and the normalcy of, um, of drug use. And that led to a, a life of adolescent crime and more trauma and more failure. And eventually I moved to Hollywood when I was 19 and um, wanted to be a rock star, you know, like so many people that moved to Hollywood. So I played in bands there and, um, and had a lot of fun, but eventually just burned my life into um, a pile of ash <laughs> figuratively and literally. And when I was 26, I got sober. I went to a treatment center and thus began the path that I'm on now, almost 25 years later of just consciousness expansion and physical healing, emotional, spiritual healing. And um, it's just, it's my passion to see, I think ultimately just how happy can I get <laughs> on a regular basis? You know, how much light can I embody? How much love can I embody? And as I've continued to build my capacity to embody that, I've been compelled to share the things along the journey that I've found and utilized that have assisted me in so doing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I got into independent media and just I just find so many tools that are valid and also find many that aren't and experiment with them and find like, ah, eh, that didn't work. And I can share with people, Hey, um, this is what has worked for me and this is what didn't. But essentially I've built a career around doing what I would be doing anyway. <laughs> really? You know, I'm just working on myself, trying to evolve. Uh, and people that are also seeking to um, evolve themselves, some of them like to um, hear about the ways in which I'm doing that. So mm -hmm. I've carved out kind of, I've had a few careers, but the one I'm in now is truly the one that feels like aligned with my purpose. And the why for what I do is so um, deeply felt within me that it gives me boundless energy to keep doing it. So the work I do doesn't feel like work. It just feels like, wow, what a gift to be able to just empower people to um, transform their lives. And, and especially people in recovery, because as I said, I, man, I know the suffering that comes from active addiction and also the suffering that comes from um, being physically sober, but lacking true recovery. I've experienced, yeah. you know, the depths of both of those. And now I'm in a place where I feel pretty damn recovered most of the time. You know, I'm not too easily um, disturbed. Mm -hmm. Even in the world in which we find ourselves today, I'm, I'm amazed at times that I'm able to just go about my day-to-day -day life and still have a sense of, um, not only that sense of purpose, but just a sense of well-being and safety and security, even in times like these that are unprecedented to say the least in a time in which many of us find ourselves just questioning everything and um, our, our existence and future and all of the things. And I don't know, somehow I'm, I'm learning how to, um, 
to navigate through it with a lighter heart and um and also just a lighter heart not only within myself but for myself right of just more self acceptance and self love and enjoying my mistakes right and actually just seizing those moments of error as bounty for my own growth like the the corrective measures along the way are becoming more fun yeah I, I, I make I mistakes all the time and you know it used to be when i made a mistake there was this rigid perfectionism that my ego would kind of keep me trapped in and I mean, now every time I do something stupid, it's just, I just laugh, you know, like, okay, now I know how to not do that, you know, and then I move on. And it's just, it's, um, it's, it's a much more free place to live. And I think ultimately that's probably maybe my highest value is just freedom. You know, I've just sought freedom and I used to seek freedom uh, in ways that, that came with a lot of consequences and side effects, you know, mm -hmm. when I got addicted to heroin, uh, when I was a teenager. Uh, I mean, what I was seeking was just freedom from my mind and freedom from painful emotions. I just, I just wanted to get out of here. And um, I, I am finding that same freedom now through practicing the principles that I practice, but there are little to no side effects, just all benefit, benefit, benefit 100%, you know? And um, so it's a much more embodied and also compounding way to live, right? When one aligns oneself with truth and you keep adhering to that truth to a deeper and larger degree, it builds upon itself. And then you find yourself living in a miraculous world, even though the world around you uh, seems to be falling apart. Inside there's an integrity and a sturdiness and a stick to um, that is really, really fascinating to experience. Yeah, it's like you're this light cheerleader, you know, suddenly. I just wanted to say that um, we have similar backgrounds. Um, currently, my father is a meth addict. My little sister is a meth addict. My little brother is a meth addict. And wow. it's just um, an incredible place. And I remember as a little girl huffing gas at like 12 and 13, being in some kid's garage. I mean, and that's kind of where it started for me, too. So. <laughs> I mean, it's like, are you crazy? And then you, what I wanted to say is that we don't know when we don't know. It's like, I remember thinking that I was a little bit woke, that I had, I was able to hear conversations about um, people that would speak about having a higher self and what a higher self looks like. But until you get to step into a deeper opportunity of the mystical until you get to really connect with the greater and then until you really do get to meet your higher self your recovery is can be really full of suffering and you mentioned yeah it's controversial but i completely believe in your why because we do not have time anymore to argue whether it works or it doesn't work what we know is that being tapped into the mystical is how we transform and there's so many addictions that are so dirty that we don't speak about them and i, I just you know because of my my family suffering that they can't get out of it's, it's, we have to be the voice. So a part of your story that I couldn't stop telling people was about the, every morning, how you would crush your crack pipe. Can you tell us that story? It <laughs> meant a lot to me. <laughs> oh God, that's funny. Sometimes I say things on stage and I forget there's, <laughs> there's actually people there watching. <laughs> it was great. I was like, you, it was just beautiful. Well, you know, it's funny though. Cause I, I put together the that presentation and oftentimes when i speak i i really don't like to prepare at all actually i have any slide deck because sometimes the intellect can get caught up and you can kind of get stuck at a certain level of consciousness if you're trying to adhere to a linear plan right because then you walk in the room and you read the energy and you're like oh i'm not going to talk about any of that and with this one because i only had 45 minutes and i wanted to cover some very specific points and create a model. It was necessary for me to go off off of the slide deck. Um, but then when I got up on stage, I was saying all kinds of shit. I'm like, Luke, this wasn't in the plan, you know. And it just it was what it was. And that the crack pipe story, yeah. I mean, God, if if anything, it displayed like the the story of suffering that I don't think it, 
I've never heard it encapsulated so well. You said, this is how hard it was. This is how dark my life was. And it was just such a good description. Well, if anything exemplifies addictive entrapment, it is a demonstration of attempting to stop every time you use, right? And I mean, especially with something like crack, there's such um, a social stigma around that. I mean, we even have a word for it, a crackhead. Like, I mean, people use that as a put down, right? Oh, you so, that guy's a crackhead, you know, even if it's not related to the use of the actual drug. And um, that one in particular was one that I, I experienced a lot of shame around using. And there's nothing like, there's nothing socially cool about smoking crack. There's no Keith Richards of crack, right? Heroin has this certain romanticism, at least to some of us it did to me. And it wasn't something that I broadcasted widely, but I never felt really ashamed that I did heroin. Um, because also just when you're under the influence of heroin, your behavior is much different than when you're under the influence of crack cocaine. I mean, me under the influence of heroin, I basically just would lock my door, uh, put the blinds down, rip the phone out of the wall, turn on bebop jazz exceedingly loud. And I would just use, not out, come to, use, not out, come to, and eventually run out of dope and just have a bunch of cigarette burns all over the carpet because I would nod out with the cigarette, you know? And it's like, I wasn't really doing anyone else any harm or I didn't have any erratic behavior because I was under the influence of that particular drug. With crack, because it's so intense and so short acting, I find myself doing all kinds of weird stuff and also out on the street constantly to get more and putting myself into dangerous situations and just the, the utmost desperation, you know? So go get a $4 rock of crack. That's like one good hit. And then maybe another 45 minutes of scraping the pipe, just trying to get some smoke to come out of that thing. And then going back to the corner and scrounging up another four to $12 for a couple more rocks. Right. I mean, I remember going to the corner so many times with like a bag of CDs, I would just, trade my CD and I'm, you know, a musician, like music was what I thought was my life. And one of my highest and highly cherished assets would be my music collection. I would trade that. And when that ran out, I would go through, um, you know, the whole apartment and find change. And I'd carry like a, a sock full of quarters, you know, to try to just get $4 together. I mean, it was just so pathetic and so demoralizing. And one thing about, um, about that story and getting to the the root of it and just how sad, just how sad it was. Uh, looking back, I mean, it's almost like I can't believe that was my life. But at the same time, I can just, I can, I can evoke those memories like it was this morning. I mean, it's just, I just remember the feeling so well. And I, and I hope I always do really, because it's, it's the thing that keeps me from ever deluding myself into thinking, well, maybe I could have a glass of wine or maybe I could do this or that. And it's been so many years, I could probably control it this time, et cetera. But yeah, with crack, you know, you have to have a special apparatus to administer that particular drug uh, in the form of a glass pipe. Otherwise you just don't really get the desired effect. And so each night that I went out to get crack, I would have to procure a new pipe. And that was a whole, <laughs> that was a whole other, you know, comedy of errors in and of itself, because where do you buy crack pipes? Well, you have to like go down alleys and, you know, um, um, befriend homeless people who's, who are in a wheelchair and are, you know, disabled in all the ways. And like their role in that melodrama of addiction on the streets of Hollywood is they're the people that during the day go buy a bunch of new crack pipes. And then at night sell them to white boys like me that are coming into the hood to score crack. Cause you, you know, you need that pipe, but, more to the point is the the depth of shame and self-inflicted demoralization that went into that using because I didn't want to do it, yet I was compelled, not every night, but on so many nights to pursue that drug. A, I didn't even really like it. B, even though I didn't like it, it was better than the existential pain of being me and my body 
in the felt experience of my failure at life. So it's like I'm going out and spending all this time and energy to get a drug that I don't even like. And it wears off so fast. And when it wears off, it's just so depressing. I mean, there's no worse feeling in the world than 10 minutes after you just took a hit of crack. I mean, it is literally the lowest of low. I don't know even if it's like a destruction of your serotonin receptors or what's going on, you know, in terms of like how it affects your brain, but it is not fun at all. And so uh, at the end of every night, which was, you know, maybe usually it was light out, it would be six, seven, eight, nine a.m until I was really ready to call it quits. And I had taken enough pills or alcohol or opiates or whatever to come down off the crack. And I knew the dealers were gone because they weren't really out in the daytime. So there was no more to have. And then I would, I would uh, put the pipe on the ground and I would smash it with my foot and just grind it into the concrete. And I'm like, this is disgusting. I'm never doing this ever again. And then I'd sleep all day and wake up and start drinking maybe 5, 6 p.m. And by 9 p.m. I'd be like, I, I got to get a rock. <laughs> and there I go again. It's like just the, the saddest groundhog day you can imagine. And, um, you know, a couple of years of that are, are, were really helpful in finally coming to a place of surrender and just, just going, I just can't live like this. I mean, this is just ridiculous. And that was just one of the drugs, right? Um, combine that with all of the other things and especially with heroin addiction it's not just like you want to do it you have to do it or you're going to get dope sick and so yeah just a few years of that and and the the times that were fun and that were out partying and experimenting with some of these drugs and and part of the lifestyle of just playing in a band in the 90s and being in hollywood and all of that, when it, when it gets to be just locked alone in your room and you've lost all your friends, unless they're one of your drug buddies. Um, and I had even very few of those and just the inability to, um, be employed in any way, even, even employed by myself, I dealt drugs. And I, at the end, I couldn't even do that anymore. <laughs> you know, I couldn't even back then you kind of, you ran on pagers and answering machines, right? If you're a dealer and this is pre cell phone. And, uh, I was just, my life was so chaotic and my behavior was so erratic that I literally couldn't even sell drugs successfully anymore. Cause I just couldn't get to a phone and just see people or anything. I just wouldn't leave my place other than to, to get more drugs. So that's, that's what that story was born out of. And it's, um, something I kind of forget about often unless someone asked me to tell a story to create a narrative. But I think that breaking of the pipe every night is indicative of all addictions, whether they're to a substance or not, right? There's, there's a still small voice within us that says, you're better than this. Your life could be bigger than this. You're smarter than this. You're more talented than this. You, you deserve better. You, you, you're, you have an intrinsic value and worth that is above this behavior. Even if it's just picking up your phone to scroll Instagram more than you would prefer you did, right? I'm going to lock my phone in the microwave and turn it on airplane you know, or whatever. It's like we, we all have these mechanisms by which we try to stop compulsive, compulsivity and addictive behavior. And I think that was just, you know, kind of a gory example of that phenomenon mm-hmm. and one that, um, that spoke to the unmanageability and my final admission that I was powerless over drugs and alcohol and that my life was unmanageable. Step one of the 12 steps is just, if that's not unmanageable, I don't know what is. I'm never doing this again. Break the pipe. Six hours later, I got to get a new pipe. I mean, it's just like, it's a comedy of errors, right? It would be funny if it wasn't so pathetic and so sad, really. Mm -hmm. Um, But after some years of that and just the consequences of my behavior, uh, yeah, thankfully... And actually, I think I shared this in that talk. It took me about 22 years to recall that what one of the main catalysts for my getting sober and hitting bottom was like a bad mushroom trip. A few months before I checked into rehab, I took a bunch of mushrooms. I sold mushrooms. That was part of the job that I couldn't uphold my duties. (laughs) And uh, 
took a bunch of mushrooms and was just trying to escape life. And that happened to be what was around. And I had this like really bad trip where I, I started feeling all this shame and self-hatred. And I couldn't like, normally if I took mushrooms, I would just laugh for hours. I was not laughing. I was bawling. I was crying. I had sort of a nervous breakdown of sorts, um, much to the disappointment of my party buddy who you know I took the mushrooms with, you know, I was going like, oh man, wow. Now he's, now I'm in a bad trip too. But I, I really, I had a realization um, in that mushroom journey that's like, dude, you need to go to AA. Like this is fucked. This is not getting better. You can't control this. You can't stop. You're never going to be able to stop. You need help. And then it took me a few more months of, of trying to manage it myself and, you know, kicking heroin or whatever. Okay. I'm just going to smoke weed now, you know, he's, um, trying to, to to micromanage my addictions and do what I later heard referred to as switching seats in the Titanic, whereas like you switch from one drug to the other, but in the end the ship's still going down. Right? <laughs> you might be in a different seat, but you're still on a path of destruction. It just might be a different poison that takes you there. So, yeah, that that mushroom journey really was um, a catalyst. And as I said, it took me a couple decades to even remember that. Oh, there was a moment in that unintentional medicine journey in which I felt just a glimmer of love for myself. That's incredible. Just, and, and, and really that's ultimately all it took was maybe, you know, I was on mushrooms. I don't remember the details of it, but the, the gist of that experience was like, maybe you're worth more than this. Maybe you could change. Maybe there's, um, maybe there's a way of existing in the world that's different than, than what you have now. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it looked like, but I was certainly given the message that w what would make that possible would be getting sober. But that, that was the key. That was the thing that needed to happen for me to escape the bondage that I was um, uh, entrapped in. You know, it's just, you got to get sober. You got to get sober. And that's what I told my friend then. I was like, man, I got to go to those meetings. I got to do something and, you know, have another beer, Luke. Just, man, don't be so serious. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it stuck on, on one level to the point where a few months later, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm out. I'm done. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And it was this with breaking the crack pipe. It was the same for me with, kicking heroin. It was, you know, the first time I found myself addicted to it, I was like, oh shit, I get sick when I don't have this stuff. Like I'm actually a junkie. That was never the plan. As I said, it was always this romantic, cool kind of rock and roll idea. And then it was not cool all of a sudden. Maybe it was never cool, but I deluded myself into thinking it was. And the first time I quit, it was like a year. I was like, oh, I'm never doing that again. I can't do dope. Right. And then I would experiment with it again or what we call chipping i would start chipping and then get it strung out things would get really dark and then i would quit again but never quitting all the drugs but just that one and then the next period was like six months then it was three months then it was one month then it was a week and then the very last time i kicked i got well probably took me three or four days and i was over the withdrawals and then i immediately went back and did it again i was like okay now i'm really fucked this is this is how this is going to go now. Like I'm, I'm one of them, one of those people I used to sort of look at in judgment, like real junkies. You know, I never thought of myself in that way. I was kind of like a stoner. Like I go to dead shows and then I like do a little heroin and crack, you know what I mean? But then it was apparent to me that I, I was really past the point of no return and that there was no way I was ever going to um, be able to manage any of this myself. And, and the, the surrender for me really was in the willingness to let go of all using and drinking. It, even, even weed, like not smoking weed to me was, I was like asking me to not be alive or to move to another planet. You know, it was just like not smoke weed. That is never happening because that was really the drug that I first found that gave me a sense of relief when I was a kid. And I, I mean, I smoked, I've only met a couple of people in my life that smoked as much weed as me. I mean, I don't know Snoop, but he's probably one of them. <laughs> but literally out of all my drug buddies, there was only maybe two or three guys the whole time that I ever met that would just smoke weed, like literally nonstop. I mean, it's just 
all day long, every day, wake up in the middle of the night to take a leak, smoke a joint, go back to, I mean, just 24 seven. And to give that up was actually just terrifying until I got to the point where I realized that later I learned the phenomenon of craving where if you want to get sober from one thing, then you can't do all the things because you activate this allergy of the body and this obsession of the mind that is taught really in, in the 12 steps. Um, and so that would happen even though I hated crystal meth and I, I did it anyway. If I did crystal meth, the allergy might manifest as me going and getting drunk, even though that wasn't the intention. Like I just want to wake up or get high or escape my reality. So once I really embraced that phenomenon of craving and the allergy of the body and the obsession of the mind, once I had that articulated for me when I was in treatment, it was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sober forever. There's no going back and trying to control any of this. It's all off the table. I'm 100% clean and sober. And I, and I was that way for 22 years until I took ayahuasca and then <laughs> a whole different sort of um, era of recovery opened up for me. Beautiful. I really know a lot about how psilocybin heals, but I don't know a lot about Ibogaine. And I heard you on stage speaking to that. Can you share a little bit about Ibogaine? Well, I've not done, um, Ibogaine is a derivative or, or a synthetic version of Iboga, which is um, an African plant medicine. And that's one that I haven't taken, actually. I've never, I don't know, as they say, I've never felt called to it. Mm -hmm. I have had a couple opportunities, but I didn't get a really strong feeling within me that it was appropriate. But if I mentioned it, it was just due to uh, pretty widespread knowledge of its efficacy in relieving addiction. I mean, I think out of all of the plant medicines, uh, Iboga is probably the one most widely known and recognized for the alleviation of addiction and specifically of opiate addictions. Mm -hmm. And I've met people personally uh, firsthand that were opiate addicts like I was, didn't go to treatment, didn't go to a 12-step group. They did Iboga for a couple nights in ceremony and never did heroin again. Um, it also, I mean, it, the, the Ibogaine drug, I mean, there's clinics that are used for people that are addicted to opiates and they give them Ibogaine and it's a way to, uh, presumably, I guess, detox from the opiates and actually have a different way of going through the withdrawal period than one might get if they were medically supervised and given pharmaceutical drugs to kind of get through that three or four days of, of hell. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that one's really interesting to me, but again, not one that I've thus far felt called to try. Mm -hmm. um, but I sense that it, I probably will at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, and definitely if it presents itself and I have that feeling in my gut, that's a true feeling, not a curiosity, but a feeling that I'm meant to go have this experience that it's going to serve my life and then the highest expression of who I am, then I, I probably would. But if I don't, I won't. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to me. And I think really that was the catalyst for my uh, voyage into the realm of psychedelics was over the years meeting more and more people that had not only used psychedelics safely in recovery, but more importantly, people that had actually been ushered into recovery and into sobriety by using plant medicines and psychedelics. And when I first started hearing that, I was like, what? Because the the old model is that complete abstinence is the only way. Abstinence from what? Not just beer, if you're a beer drinker, but abstinence from all mind-altering chemicals. And that was the paradigm that I um, sort of grew up in, in my own recovery. And, and rightly so, because as I said, based on my past experience in active addiction, I prove that to be true. Because if I did a drug that I wasn't even addicted to, it would lead me back to the other drugs that I was addicted to, or I would just become addicted to that new drug, right? So that, that phenomenon of craving was definitely present, but I think the, the defining uh, differential in terms of the characteristics of how different mind-altering substances interact with one's sobriety and recovery is that they're are a classification of substances that do produce that phenomenon of craving and lead one back into active addiction. But there's a whole other class of substances that in fact 
oftentimes have the opposite effect and take one even further from a life of um, ongoing addiction. And so as I started to just kind of hear anecdotal reports of that, it started piquing my, my curiosity. And, and also in that within the history of recovery itself, as you indicated earlier, the mystical experience, what, what produces an initial and a sustained sobriety is a mystical or spiritual experience. And indeed, you could say, and, and this would be my position, that the entire purpose of the 12 steps, and just using that as the most prevalent and widely effective model of recovery, the purpose of applying those principles to one's life is to have a spiritual experience. It's right in the 12th step. It says, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. What are those steps? Those steps are um, principles that one can apply to their life in an active manner that produce a psychic change, that produce a spiritual awakening, awakening to the nature of who you really are. And for some, it takes a lot of time for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's gradual. And that happened to me over the course of those first 22 years prior psychedelics. Um, I was completely changed. I was a different person. I'd experienced a psychic change. Uh, so many of my character defects had been eradicated and, and I had so much inner and outer success as a reflection of the application of those principles. But I had never, well, I once I, I experienced a, a mystical experience once pre plant medicine, it just was a spontaneous moment in which it became very clear to me that there was a God <laughs> to say it like that. It was, it was palpable. It was powerful. It was transformative but it was also so spontaneous that I didn't know how to repeat it. And it wasn't something that I could quote uh, cause to happen, right? There wasn't like a certain meditation or a certain behaviors or practices that went into that. It was just a moment of benediction. It was a moment of grace in which I was just floored in the um, experience of divinity. So the, the recovery programs and the steps ultimately are leading you to that place. But if you go back to the origins of the 12 step movement with its co-founder, Bill Wilson, his initial sobriety was brought about by something to which he referred as a white light experience. And, you know, he described it as the room filling with a great wind of spirit and everything was different after. I mean, it sounded like a psychedelic experience the way he explained it, right? Just this mystical, transformative, transcendent experience. And then after that, the craving for alcohol was gone. And his whole life, presumably, and the purpose of the 12 steps were in pursuit of finding a way to transmit that experience to other people. Mm -hmm. And thus, after that came, you know, the actual quantification and documentation of the Alcoholics Anonymous literature and all of the groups that were born out of that. But really the seed of that was this mystical experience that, that this man experienced and then went, went on to sh share with others. <clears throat> and in so doing, developed um, perhaps a more reliable and sturdy and safe way for people to have that. That said, later in his life, as has been documented in official Alcoholics Anonymous literature, Bill Wilson went and experimented uh, clinically with LSD on a number of occasions, knowing that what had brought about his initial sobriety was this profound mystical experience. And in the early days of LSD, when it was still used um, clinically more so than socially in the movement of the hippies in the 60s, all that hadn't happened yet. This is in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, he sought out those treatments mm -hmm. in an effort to alleviate his depression and some of the persistent underlying issues that he still experienced even at 20 plus years sober. Right. And when he did in fact find that he had the ability to replicate that mystical experience using LSD, he actually sought to bring that modality of treatment into the body of Alcoholics Anonymous and was met, you know, and understandably so with much resistance and it, it never took off, right? No one, right. no one was going for it. And, and you can see into the mid and late sixties, why this would have never, you, you, you watch people supposedly jumping off buildings, thinking they're a bird, all the propaganda around the vilification of psychedelics. There's just no way that that could have integrated itself within the 12 step movement. And so it didn't. However, now we find ourselves at a completely different place in history because 
the context of psychedelics, the context of therapy, the context of um, mystical and spiritual experiences that, as they pertain to recovery has changed. And you now have the collective experience of people since the beginning of the 12 step movement and today, which was 1935 till 2021 at the time of this conversation, there are many people from all walks of life all over the world that have gotten sober outside of the confines of the 12 step movements. And there are also a growing number of people like myself and possibly you, I don't know what your relationship is with various groups, but um, you know, it's anonymous. So you never really say, but uh, <laughs> I, I would say I have experience with 12 step groups. You know, you could perhaps broadly say that and still maintain um, the respect for the traditions of those groups. But um now many of us are going like, oh God, I was stuck at a certain level of development, at a certain level of consciousness, no matter how many years and no matter uh, the, the degree of commitment with which I committed to my program of recovery. In my case, there were not only levels of consciousness that I, I could not ascend to, there were also other manifestations of dysfunction and addictive patterns that I couldn't break despite having jumped around to a lot of different 12 step groups that specialized in whatever thing I happened to be having trouble with. And, and in each of those explorations, there was improvement, but I think at the core of this, there is quite often underlying trauma that's very difficult to uproot and heal no matter how you do it in linear time in the cause and effect model of the space-time continuum of the material world in which we find ourselves. When you enter into the mystical realms, whether they be brought about by psychedelics or otherwise, you're able to uh, identify and heal mm -hmm. past traumas in a time that is no way relevant to earthly clock bound time that's so interesting i've never heard it say that way it's it's quant it's quant it's quantum it's you're yeah. in the quantum okay mm -hmm. when when you're in a legitimate medicine experience you're in the realm of quantum outside of this material world and space and time you are interdimensionally traveling out of this out of the limitations of the physical world into the field of consciousness in which there is no time so the five-year-old little boy, in my case, that was abused in the quantum reality is right here with me right now. And in a medicine space, I can be in relationship to that boy. I know. It's, it's so beautiful. I know. But I can be in relationship to that little boy in real time right now because of the, absten the absence of the limitations of time and space. Mm -hmm. And I love therapy. This is nothing to downplay the uh, authenticity or effectiveness of therapy, but sitting in a therapist's office for an hour, once a week, talking about and processing what happened to that little boy could work to affect healing, but it's gonna be hella slow. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take a long, long time. Mm -hmm. In a five minute interaction with that little boy in the quantum space of a deep medicine experience, it could be a millisecond in which that little boy is healed. And in healing that little boy, which is still integrated into who I am as a 51 year old man, now my thought, feeling and behavior pattern is forever altered from this point moving forward, coming out of that experience provided I'm mindful about the process of integration and, and creating meaning and creating a model and some framework about what has just happened. So being very devoted and committed to recovery for 22 years, a, a lot of change took place and a lot of evolution took place. And I think that because there was a lot of boots on the ground, real time, hard work, and a lot of grace that took place in my life and in my journey of recovery during that time, I was very fertile ground to start to explore the medicine realm because when I entered into those experiences, and, con and it continues to be this way, it's like I have a philosophical framework and an understanding of what I'm doing in there and what the purpose of those experiences are. 
And when dots start to connect and I'm in that quantum sort of interdimensional reality and, and convening with God in a way that would be less visceral and tangible in my normal waking state, I can just get in there and move mountains and, and remove the barriers to grace. And that grace is always there ready to help me transform and heal. Mm -hmm. But in normal waking state, it's difficult to access and find time for that. And, and everything's kind of limited to earth time and it's, it's slow and sometimes cumbersome. And also because it's slow, it's also difficult to track one's progress. Whereas in the atmosphere of a medicine space, I find I'm able to track the healing and the realizations and the presence of God in real time, even though there's no time. It, it's, it's happening so fast because you're outside of the limitations that you would normally be bound by. And then post ceremony or therapy session or whatever that looked like, one has the potential to emerge as a totally different person and to discard patterns of thought and behavior that were so deeply entrenched, there was just no way to uproot them. Or you at least didn't even know that they were there. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, exactly, exactly. But I mean, add to that kind of a, an understanding of what they are, which I think I had to a pretty large degree from reading every book, you know, going to India, studying all the things, right? Doing all the things, Kundalini yoga, breath work. I mean, just you name it, I've done it. Um, that even though I could see some of those patterns and, and contextualize some of the trauma from early life, I still couldn't get to it, mm -hmm. right? And so in the medicine space, it's like not only can I now see it, but I can also see it in its full magnitude. In other words, like, oh, it's not just a story of what happened to this little boy that was me. It's like seeing it and re-feeling it in a, in a way that's safe and not re, at least for me, not re-traumatizing because the set and setting and the container and the grid that's been created by the people that are conducting the ceremony and the whole intentionality behind it is actually created to facilitate just that, to, to be able to go into the core wounds, into the depths of shadow safely and interact with all of that and actually understand it on a deeper level, but more than anything to discard it and heal it and to just actually totally move beyond it. And this is so evident in my life 